right, for this last section, I'm going to let you guys have free reign. I can always cut it down with the editing tool if we go too long. But these doctrines uh, are associated with the book of Revelation. Both of them deal heavily in this book. They seem to be offering, and in, in both of you have used this term, a secret knowledge about world events. When we hear world events today, and we want to run to the book of Revelation and start trying to find information there, what's the danger in that? I think that somewhat ignores the context that it identifies. Um, in chapter 1, it talks about those things that will shortly come to pass, and here's a time statement, and I'm comfortable with the context and the way that it it follows through, pointing mm -hmm. to events that affected first and second century Christians and slightly beyond dealing with Roman persecution. You know, anything much beyond that, like I said, with the Olivet Discourse, you're going to have to say, okay, it's going to be a rebuilt temple. It's not the temple that uh, was destroyed in AD 70 and things like that. So, uh, to try to associate it with world events that continue today just divorces it from the, its own context and indicators within the text. You know, one thing, too, to go with what Kyle said, Jared, is there's, you know, we're talking about eschatology or into time issues, but I think that has a real impact on our ability to share the gospel of Christ with people who are aware of what has happened in the past historically, and then time keeps going. So what I mean by that, let's say we're talking about Ukraine right now. We could just go back in history. I'm sure you go back to World War II even, and you have people that thought this was it, you know, and you could look at all kinds of historical events. Well, if you're sharing this view, like what you're describing, that Revelation is talking about the specific event, and I'm sure you can find people saying, okay, Ukraine, this is it. And then time passes, and you get over that historical event, and there's another one, and then there's another one, and then there's another one. Any, you know, uh, observer of this goes, wait a minute, well, the Bible, if that's what the Bible was talking about, which it wasn't, but if that's what the Bible's talking about, I'm going to lose any confidence in its reliability. Um, so this false interpretation ends up feeding into more and more skepticism mm -hmm. about Christ. And it's not because it should that the Bible does this, but it's because of a false interpretation. You know, from my perspective, both of these doctrines require that people take a deep dive into the book's imagery and tease out things that I think we've all said aren't meant to be teased out and separated from the rest of the, the message. The Armageddon, the binding of Satan, the descending of Jerusalem. How We see those misused all the time. Does that significantly alter the message of the book of Revelation when those those images are used and they're they're wrenched from their context? Well, it certainly can. You know, I think the big big overall theme is to a people that are facing intense persecution. Uh, they're offered hope that there's going to be deliverance. Uh, this is not going to be the end for them. And ultimately, Christ will be victorious. And I think that's the big picture that runs throughout. Now, I don't think that means that we can't draw concepts. We can't draw um, certain indicators from certain things, like the binding of Satan, for example. I, I personally am of the judgment that that is describing a type of cessation of um, supernatural types of activity, demon possession and things like that. And I think that harmonizes with Zechariah 13 uh, that will take place when the, the kingdom uh, reigns. And I think that's the period we are in now. Uh, but I, I don't think that we should try to understand every kind of thing about, well, what's the nature of the binding and, and that sort of thing. I think it's describing a limitation mm -hmm. of certain powers. Um, you mentioned Armageddon, and um, that is an example of something that I think happens a few times in the book. And there are probably a few figures of speech that could be used to describe it, but one that Bruce and I were talking about, there's a figure of speech called 
antonomasia. And what it basically is, is a, a word change or an association of a known word or circumstance with the situation. Now, Armageddon literally refers to the, the mountain of Megiddo. And if we understand, there are many times in the history of Israel that that plain in front of Megiddo became kind of a meeting place for armies to clash. And I think the way you see it used there is not of a prediction of some coming earthly conflict, but it is a spiritual way of describing the conflict that exists between the forces of good and evil. But God will ultimately be victorious. So we shouldn't mm -hmm. look for some literal Armageddon. It's applying that name that had historical connotations to what's going on. That was so good. I don't know what I'm supposed to say. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking that too. I mean, that's just, that was really good. <laughs> well, I, I think what Kyle said, just to reiterate, I, one thing we haven't mentioned, though, and I think even, you know, our brethren, we have to take, as students of Scripture, we can take this in consideration. From a bigger picture of how we read the Bible, it's important to know there are different genres of literature in the Bible. We don't read it in precisely the same way as we might read Acts, for instance, when we're reading Revelation or we're reading poetry. Uh, you know, they're understanding metaphors and the richness of language. And I think if we could just observe that, that would go a long way in, in helping us, for instance, in the book of Revelation, uh, read it in its context so we can understand this big, big picture. Now, both of you have talked about how Revelation is not a timeline. It's not written in code. So let me ask you this. What is it? Well, that, that timeline approach, um, you know, often folks have tried to treat it that way. I, I think uh, that commentary that was in the Gospel Advocate series on the book of Revelation kind of approached it as sort of a historical timeline. Um, I, I see it a little bit more, and again, back to the, the dreams of Joseph. You know, it wasn't just one dream. It was a few dreams that would kind of illustrate in different ways the same point. I kind of think Revelation may be viewed in that way. You have some cycles of oppression, persecution, hardship, deliverance. Oppression, persecution, hardship, deliverance. So if if it's kind of different ways of expressing the same point, you don't have to see it as this timeline. Now, with that said, I don't think that that means there's no indication of events or things that can be anticipated. The way I would put it is I think most of the book of Revelation applies to the Roman persecution of the church. When you get up to about chapter 20, it then talks about uh, after that is put down, Christ reigning uh, over his church spiritually until the final resurrection, the final judgment. And I think the last two chapters are ways of describing uh, the glorified church in heaven. And yeah. so I think there is a timeline in that sense. Now, I, I've used the term code in the past, and I kind of would modify that in this way. That figure speech I mentioned a while ago, antonomasia, are there times in which a name is replaced? Yeah, Revelation chapter 2, that woman Jezebel. You know, it's not really Jezebel from Ahab and Jezebel. It's talking about a wicked woman, but... Those that know Scripture know what that means. Now, right. when you get to the figures of Babylon, um, yes, during a period of Roman persecution, I think they could probably figure out if you're saying Babylon when you're talking about Rome, they know what you mean. But it may not make them quite as mad <laughs> if at <laughs> least you're couching it in yeah. uh, some Old Testament language. So maybe code isn't the word to use. But I do think there are those times where Babylon is talking about Rome. Uh, Sodom mm -hmm. is talking about Jerusalem. So I think that kind of thing, not code necessarily, but uh, that sort of approach. You know, Jesus does that kind of thing, too. Uh, we were talking about Matthew 24. 
there wasn't a Jew alive that didn't know what the significance of the abomination of desolation was when he said that. Mm. And so I think that's a great point, too. Again, that's the richness of the language, though. And we see that throughout Scripture. You know, even when Paul's writing and he references a verse, let's say in the book of Romans, you have to go back and look at that context. What is he What is he really conveying in that statement? Uh, so to try to read the Bible, I guess in a super flat, hyper-literal way that denies figures and denies metaphors and denies all of that richness of language, uh, to me, that's just not how we need to need to read this. So when I talk about Revelation, and I try to teach people a book, I talk about, and I use this illustration with Mark, it's a lot like pulling back a curtain and showing spiritual realities that are behind the events of the world that are unfolding, that are affecting the lives of Christians. Being that there's spiritual realities going on that we see them as struggles, we see them as difficulties, we may even see them one day as persecution, but it is the battle between good and evil that's going on. Jesus is always victorious. You know, it's interesting, you talked about Armageddon a few minutes ago, and people want to make this out to be, as Mark alluded to this as well, this big battle where there's going to be Abram's tank surrounding a descending city of Jerusalem and all these things, and you look at the book of Revelation, it's like three verses, <laughs> it just says it's going to happen and victory is claimed before it even starts. Yeah. Mm -hmm. When we talk about these things, many of many of the events in our world are faith shaking. How can understanding that there's a greater spiritual reality beyond the troubling events in our world, how is that comforting to us today in the same way it was comforting to the first century reader? I think that it stabilizes us um, because that assurance really causes us to think more about the nature of God, the victory of God's people, to get our minds focused on these greater spiritual realities, which are outside of our immediate context. And I think that's what it means to walk by faith, that whatever my immediate context is, uh, my my knowledge of who God is and, and that I, I may not know everything about every detail, but I know that he uh, means good spiritually for his people. You know, Revelation is much like the, the last chapters of the book of Daniel that prophesies this period of intense persecution that would come uh, under the period between the, the Testaments. And like Revelation, both offer post-death victory and it assures those that even if even if your life is taken because of your faith you're ultimately going to be victorious and i think that's the comfort that, that all of us should should gain from it we shouldn't worry about the events that are going to go on and how bad it can get it may get bad and we should be prepared for that but the message mm -hmm. of daniel the message of revelation is we know who wins and we want to be on the winning side well, and I ask this question, guys, because there's a lot of people today who are among our brethren who would say, I, I, there's just nothing in us for Revelation. I mean, Revelation was all about first century. I mean, they're not going full preterism or anything like that, but they're they're saying, you know, we can't understand it. It's just this statement that God wins and he was going to be victorious over the Romans and reassuring the first century church. And I think that's a very short-sighted view of the book mm -hmm. because uh, you both alluded to something. It's stabilizing to the faith of the individual that if Jesus cared for the first century church this way, he cares for the church this way presently. And while we may not have any type of reassurance given to us that we can go and say, okay, I can be reassured he's going to deal with the situation in the Ukraine or something like that, which I'm not saying it's about that, but I can be reassured of that the same way the first century church was reassured by the, by understand what the mystery of the woman sitting on the seven heads is. I can still look at that and say, Jesus hasn't changed. God hasn't changed. Nothing has changed except we just don't have a literal prophecy about the events that are unfolding in our lives. 
But just like we would go to Old Testament prophecy and say, there is value in understanding who God is, who Jesus is, and what this means for his people. Shouldn't we say the same thing about Revelation? Absolutely. And in the hope that it sets um, beyond this life, too. You know, we've talked about some of the consequences of both of these views. Um, one of the consequences of full preterism is it requires that you minimize some of the promises. And they wouldn't put it that way, but that's what they've got to do. You know, um, I think when Revelation 21 talks about a time in which there's no death, no pain, no tears, I believe that that literally describes a hope that the Christian can have where I suffer here. There's a time I won't have to feel that way. But right. if we now are living in what that was pointing to, then it minimizes all that. It says no tears, but mm -hmm. it doesn't really mean no tears. But I, I think right. there's so much hope that, you know, I can endure difficulties now because there's a glorious hope that awaits the child of God. Bruce? Oh, just want to join with what Kyle has, has said. You know, I... Um, there are preterists that have said we're walking on streets of gold right now. And that's the extent of what they believe. They don't even have it foreshadowing anything else at all, you know, and uh, what a, whether they want to admit it or not, that's a hopeless doctrine. And it is, as Kyle said, minimizes the promises of God for his people. And we don't want to do that. And we want to embrace those, be stabilized by those, be encouraged by those. And know that whatever comes our way, we, we're going to be faithful to God. Yeah, and, and the hopelessness of that doctrine, and really both of these doctrines, is in that they emphasize a very material view of the kingdom of God. And a very, the materialism, and I don't mean the collection of stuff, I mean the, the fleshly material of ourselves, we can't let that go. And that seems to be sort of the epicenter of both of these doctrines. Yeah. With, we're, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, no. I was just going to say what you're saying is exactly right, Jared, as far as, you know, we see the materialism and fleshliness of, of, of premillennialism. And that's a big problem. Then you have this, uh, such a, a highly spiritualized view by the, full preterist that they end up denying the actual promises of God. Uh, mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, just to imagine the, the nature of those errors in comparison to the Bible, it just doesn't harmonize. Well, guys, let me ask you one last question. I've enjoyed this discussion. I really have. And I knew I would, but way, even way more than I thought it would. I know because I've been on YouTube a while now. The next video that's going to be suggested beyond the two that I put up on either side, YouTube's going to suggest something by a guy like John Hagee or, or maybe, Bruce, you mentioned a Holger Neubauer <laughs> that is going to completely try to undo everything that you've tried to say to help us understand what these doctrines are and really what the book of Revelation means uh, as we draw back from those errors. I want each of you to give me three things that you want the audience to take away that will help them keep their focus in the right spot. First. Oh, I get to go first. My three things. I, I would say, um, number one, um, really allow yourself as, as a student of scripture to receive what God's word says without allowing something, some system or paradigm outside to infiltrate as you're interpreting scripture. So really trust what the scripture says. Secondly, um, know that what God has promised, he will be true to exactly what he has promised. And so if you hear something that's undermining what the scriptures clearly promise, then you know that's a false notion. And I would also say any doctrine that would undercut the assurance that believers in Jesus have, um, I think that would concern me. And so those should be all positive things we can embrace. God's word, allowing myself to see it in its context, seeing how that gives me assurance and uh, just, just trusting what it says to be true. 
I would offer kind of three passages that kind of hit some core concepts that uh, all of these issues uh, are, are relevant to all these issues. First, has the kingdom been established? Matthew chapter 16, verse 28, Jesus would say, Assuredly, I say to you, there are some standing here who shall not taste death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Now, either that happened or Jesus lied. And I think we've got to conclude that it happened. And uh, in fact, the kingdom did come. Now, on this issue of, well, did he come and we didn't see it, we missed it. In Matthew chapter 24, in the context of talking about, after it's talked about this abomination of desolation, and you'll see it, but then it makes the statement, if some then start to say, look, here's the Christ, there he is, and it talks about don't believe them, don't believe them, and makes the powerful statement in verse 27, whereas mm -hmm. the lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. The very fact that we debate, well, did Jesus come in AD 70, or as Jehovah's Witnesses argue, did he come in the 40s or something like that? If we have to ask the question, he didn't come. When he comes, it'll be like lightning. It'll be unmistakable, and nobody will miss it. And the last thing that I would offer is, if this concept is true, that it's all already been fulfilled, there's a, a passage in 1 Corinthians 15 that is describing what happens when it's all occurred, when the end has taken place. And let's just ask ourselves, do we live in these conditions now? Mm -hmm. Or this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible has put on corrupt incorruption, and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Has that happened? I don't believe it has in any uh, way in which we could conceive of it. So that is a future hope. Well, thank you, gentlemen. I can't add anything to that. Thank you, Jerry. Uh, I really appreciate both Bruce Reeves and Kyle Pope being with us today. They have, both of these men have spent a lot of time studying this doctrine, not just to debate it, but to because they believe that your salvation hangs upon putting the proper perspective on the kingdom of Christ and how eternity will be fulfilled. And so I hope that you, if you stayed with us through the whole video, I hope that you've got something out of this. If you've got questions, leave them in the comments. I might even get one of these two guys to come on and sort of moderate that a little bit with their answers. If you'd like something a little more in depth than what the preacher in Oregon can do. But I'm going to put a link to our series on Revelation over here. And to my left side, I'll put a link to our series on evidences. So you can check out both of those because I think you might find them interesting. Bruce, Kyle, thank you for being with us. And to all of you out there, have a good day. God bless.